everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. McClintock. I am an orthopedic surgeon that specializes in shoulder and elbow surgery here in Roseville, California. And I just wanted to take a little bit of time to reach out today and provide some more information on rotator cuff tears and talk about how we evaluate these injuries, how we manage these injuries, and really what treatment options are available to uh, each patient because everybody's situation is a little bit different. Um, your goals and your objectives in seeking treatment can also vary from person to person. So I think it, the more information you have, the more uh, educated you'll be when you're making those decisions in regard to your own health care. So I am a board certified orthopedic surgeon with fellowship training in advanced uh, reconstruction of the shoulder and elbow. And I relocated to the Roseville, California area in uh, summer of 2021 so that I could establish a practice that was really dedicated to treating upper extremity conditions and really give patients a more personalized experience with their medical care. So my goal is to partner with you to restore your lifestyle and help you achieve the quality of life that you're seeking from day to day. So the rotator cuff is a group of tendons that surround the shoulder. And I have a little schematic here that I'll show you uh, shortly. Um, and they attach onto the ball of the shoulder joint. So the ball and socket. The primary function is to provide a dynamic stabilizing balance um, that kind of balances those forces around the shoulder because as you know, the shoulder is the most mobile joint in our body. We can put it in so many different positions and do so many different things with it. Uh, I like to kind of compare it to a golf ball that's sitting on a golf tee. The socket is very shallow and it's different than a hip. A hip is very well contained with bony anatomy. The shoulder is not so much. So we rely heavily on soft tissues for joint stability. And so the rotator cuff plays a really critical role in providing some of that stability when we're using our arm in space. The way the rotator cuff works is it grabs onto the ball and kind of sucks it into the socket uh, when you're using your arm and it helps to create a stable center of motion so that you can pivot around uh, that, that nice solid uh, fulcrum and really achieve the range of motion and strength that your arms need to function and perform activities. So the goal of treatment when you have a rotator cuff tear is really to restore that equilibrium or that balance of those forces that act across that shoulder joint throughout the arc of motion. Here's that diagram that I was talking about. So the anterior view is looking from the front of the shoulder and you can see that uh, this muscle belly here, we call this the subscapularis. It has a large broad tendon in the front of the shoulder kind of behind your collarbone and on the top of your shoulder blade is this muscle here called the supraspinatus. Below that is the infraspinatus. And finally, this smaller uh, tendon in the far back here is called the teres minor. So they kind of wrap around the humeral head or the ball of the shoulder and create a nice solid cuff of tissue um, that completely encases the joint. So when we're talking about rotator cuff tears, we're talking about one of these four tendons and most often it's it's uh, this tendon on the top the supraspinatus can be the subscapularis in the front these two tendons in the back are less often affected especially the teres minor so in general a rotator cuff tear is a very common source of shoulder pain um, it can cause decreased range of motion um, it can cause pain with activity uh, and there's kind of two distinct categories that we refer to when we're looking at rotator cuff tears on imaging as a clinician. So there's kind of a degenerative tear, which is just over time uh, aging, wear and tear on that tendon throughout the normal activities of, of daily life and um, kind of recreational activities. And then there's also the traumatic tear. We tend in general to see the Degenerative tears occurring more frequently as people age. So when people are getting into their 50s, 60s, 70s, and so forth, uh, we, send it, we tend to see the traumatic tears in a younger age population, maybe in their 30s or early 40s. So those aren't hard and fast rules, but that's kind of the norm. 
I think a lot of times, a lot of questions that I get from patients when they find out that they have a rotator cuff tear is, uh, how did I get this tear? I didn't do anything. I just woke up one day and my shoulder started hurting. So they've done some studies to kind of look at the background of rotator cuff tears. And um, if you look at the epidemiology, when you hit about 60 years of age, uh, approximately 30% of patients have a full thickness tear. Um, just because you have a tear doesn't mean it has to hurt. So that's why a lot of these patients don't know that they have a tear until they wake up one morning and start having pain. When you get to age 70 and older, almost 75% of these patients have a full thickness tear. So over time, the life cycle of that tendon, the way that it's designed and the way that it's blood supply is uh, organized, they just don't have real good regenerative ability or healing ability. And so these kind of cumulative effects of a lifetime of use really start to show their effects when people get into their 60s and 70s and so forth. Some of the risk factors for rotator cuff tears include age, so advanced age or um, uh, typically not in young patients. Smoking, that affects the blood supply. Uh, hypercholesterolemia, um, so people who have you know, this is, this can be genetically related people who have uh, high cholesterol take medications to control their cholesterol, um, are at an increased risk and family history. This is just kind of a little diagram that, that it kind of dis describes that visually these degenerative tears are more older patients and it's typically affecting the uh, supraspinatus, um, and infraspinatus, which is the, those two tendons that are on the top of the shoulder. And then every once in a while, it can affect that larger tendon on the front of the shoulder. There is a theory that a condition called impingement can lead to uh, tearing of the rotator cuff over time. So this bone on the top of our shoulder here is called the acromion. And the theory is, is that when you raise your arm up over a shoulder level, uh, the rotator cuff kind of runs into that bone and through repetitive you know, use and just doing that over and over and over again, that bone can kind of rub that, that uh, rotator cuff um, and make it start to degrade and thin out and become weakened so that one day it spontaneously tears. And then there's these acute avulsions. So this is often that, that stronger tendon in the front, the subscapularis, um, it requires a lot of force. These are strong tendons and for an acute tear to occur, um, it's usually, you know, a pretty forceful injury. Um, and, and people are, they're aware of it right away. We do see when you hit around 40 years of age, the rotator cuff tissues start to decrease in their elasticity. And when people are young and they suffer a shoulder dislocation, it's very rare to tear their rotator cuff. When you get over age 40 and you suffer a shoulder dislocation, it can happen quite frequently. So often that's a mechanism for an acute avulsion type injury in somebody who's, you know, say 45 or 50 years old. But again, you would know these acute injuries have occurred because it's a sharp or it's a, it's a large force that's required. There are some other conditions that can be associated with a rotator cuff tear. Um, these are just a couple of imaging slices from MRIs. This image on the top here is demonstrating what's called the AC joint or the acromioclavicular joint. You can feel that on the top of your shoulder. There's usually a little kind of a little bump on the top there. So as that joint gets arthritic, as we age, spurs can develop on the under surface of that joint. And that sits right on top of the rotator cuff. Sometimes you can have, you know, kind of a mass effect, if you will, of those spurs pushing down on the rotator cuff, wearing out the tendon and causing trouble. You can also see problems with the biceps tendon. So this is another slice of the shoulder here. This is the socket. This is the ball or the humeral head. And there's a little groove right here on the bone that's called the bicipital groove. And this black structure right here is the biceps tendon. It should be sitting in the middle of this little groove. And um, you can see that it's subluxed or, or kind of popped out of the groove, if you will. In order for that to happen, 
this tendon in the front, the subscapularis tendon has to have a tear uh, for that tendon to jump out and kind of move into the joint space. So that's a, a pain generator um, and something that we look for often. And then I already mentioned the impingement, which is basically coming back up to this picture. This is that, that bone that's called the acromion right here. And you can see how closely it sits in relation to the rotator cuff tendon. So when you lift your arm up, it kind of runs this rotator cuff tendon into the bone right here. And some of the way that those bones develop and form as we age and, and grow for, uh, into skeletal maturity can have an effect on whether or not that is more of a problem for one person than another. I think it's important to understand that not all tears are equal. All tears can generate pain and all tears can be asymptomatic. Uh, I've seen patients who have little tiny small tears who are in 10 out of 10 pain. I've seen patients who have massive full thickness tears who have no pain, but are just having some weakness. And that's what prompts them to be evaluated. So these do behave differently in different people because we use our arms in a different manner, depending on our lifestyle. Um, but we kind of classify these tears in general as partial thickness tears, a full thickness tear, something that's called an interstitial tear, which I tried to kind of get a little bit of a picture here for you to describe. So this top image is a full thickness tear. It's pretty obvious to see this large uh, increased signal on the um, uh, top of the humeral head here indicates that this rotator cuff tendon, which is sitting over here, has torn from its location where it normally should be, which is out here. This image down here below demonstrates an interstitial tear where you have rotator cuff fibers here and on the top surface of the tear, but it's kind of the inside portion of the tendon. So it's the tendon's not completely detached from bone. There's still tendon tissue that's working, uh, but the tendon's not completely healthy. And so that can generate pain depending on the person. We do have a category that we take into consideration when we're looking at imaging and treating patients, and that's this irreparable rotator cuff. Uh, tear. And so there are some patients who have a large tear. It's been there for quite some time. The tendon has atrophied, it's retracted, and there's really no good tissue to, to heal and sew back to the bone, if you will. When I tell people that they have a rotator cuff tear, obviously the next question that comes to their mind is, what do I do about it now? Because um, I'm tired of the pain and I can't do you know, my hobbies or I have trouble at work. I'm not getting good sleep. Those are really common, you know, goals that people are trying to achieve from day to day. Some considerations that we take into account when we're making recommendations for treatment include the patient's activity level, their age, uh, the mechanism of the tear. We tend to be much more aggressive in treating those traumatic tears than we are with those degenerative kind of cumulative tears and also the characteristics of the tear. So, a full thickness tear is going to be treated a little bit differently than a partial thickness tear or one of those interstitial tears. In general, the, the rotator cuff has poor innate healing potential, as I mentioned before. And so conservative treatment, when we're talking about treatment options, is really aimed at managing the side effects of the tear. Those, uh, the inflammation associated with the tear often leads to pain. The pain leads to decreased function. Um, people lose range of motion, they have difficulty sleeping. Um, it really can interfere with just about every uh, facet of their life. When we talk about surgical options, um, our goal with surgery is aimed at fixing those tears and eliminating those symptoms of inflammation, pain, loss of strength, difficulty sleeping, etc. First and foremost, we always start out with non-operative management unless there's some extenuating circumstance or you know, somebody's already gone through extensive conservative treatment before they end up in my office. Um, that includes NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, things like ibuprofen, Aleve, some prescription forms of that, whether it's Meloxicam or Celebrex. Really, the goal of those is to decrease inflammation and then to get into physical therapy. The theory behind the therapy is that if we can strengthen the musculature around the shoulder blade 
and other supporting actors, if you will, for shoulder function, that we can help that joint work more efficiently, even though there's a tear present. And that can oftentimes alleviate symptoms, help improve strength and get rid of some of the pain that's generated. Uh, we do use cortisone injections. We do need to be a little bit cautious when we're using cortisone in the shoulder. There is some evidence in the literature that over time, if you do too many injections of cortisone into the shoulder, you can set yourself up for um, complications down the road. Um, and so we tend not to do repetitive injections over and over again, unless someone is not an ideal surgical candidate. And so these kind of three modalities, they're really the first line treatment for most tears, as I said. And a lot of times, depending on the insurance provider and the patient's background, the recommendation is to try three to six months of conservative treatment before you jump into recommending a surgical procedure. Some patients are asking me about platelet-rich plasma. Uh, I think there is definitely a role for PR, we call it PRP. The main thing to keep in mind is that uh, when we take PRP, what we're doing is we're drawing a patient's blood, we're putting it into a centrifuge, and we're spinning the blood down to harvest those um, high potent healing factors that our body naturally produces so that we can inject them into the tear uh, in a high concentration and try to actually um, stimulate healing. So I think that's the one characteristic difference between like a cortisone injection is strictly designed to decrease inflammation. A PRP injection can decrease inflammation, but it can also potentially uh, initiate like a healing response from the body. My caution to patients, PRP needs to be used in, a, in the right type of tear. If you have a full thickness rotator cuff tear, there's really no good indication for uh, PRP. These are best suited for partial thickness tears or interstitial tears of the rotator cuff. And I like to do it in office under ultrasound so I can kind of image the rotator cuff and try to get that PRP injection right into that location where the tear is. Probably the biggest downfall to PRP is that right now, most insurance companies are not covering it. So it's an out-of-pocket expense for each patient. So that's something that you're going to have to take into consideration when you're making those decisions. Uh, PRP is, is not necessarily stem cells. Stem cells are a, a type of cell that's in kind of a pre-development phase that has the potential to differentiate itself into different types of cell lines. As a whole, we classify this as orthobiologics. So we're basically trying to increase the biology or the body's natural healing ability around that rotator cuff tear. So the stem cell treatment and some of these other things on the horizon, I think there's more emphasis being placed on researching these, trying to find new options uh, that are non-surgical to treat some of these rotator cuff tears and see if we can avoid the OR for those patients. But as of right now, there's no widespread use of any stem cell therapy for, for the shoulder. So when people fail conservative treatment, when it comes to having these patients go through those non-operative treatment options, we want to demonstrate that the patient is not going to improve um, and reach a state where they can do their, you know, live day to day, perform their activities and work responsibilities without pain or dysfunction. And so when that's been clearly demonstrated, then the recommendation is to go ahead and fix those rotator cuff tears. And in 2022, in the modern age, we're doing these through arthroscopic approaches. So these are anywhere from three to five small incisions that are strategically placed around the shoulder. And we are able to use an anchor uh, that we place into the bone that has heavy duty sutures attached and we sew those uh, or feed those sutures through the tendon so that we can sew it back down and compress it to bone. Over the course of time, your body has to scar those tendons in place. So the sutures are kind of the initial point of fixation. Your body is going to provide the glue or the scar tissue healing to get that tendon completely healed. So that process takes about three months. And so depending on the type of the tear, you know, its size, its thickness, and um, how involved the 
the rehab is afterwards. I kind of give people a ballpark estimate for recovery of three to six months. It, it kind of depends on some of those tear, uh, tear characteristics and what we have to do to fix it. So I thought it would be somewhat helpful to show people how this is done arthroscopically. This is a video of a rotator cuff repair being done through an arthroscopic approach. Um, so these small instruments are introduced into the shoulder and um, we're able to shave down bone spurs um, and repair that tendon. So you can see this tissue is the rotator cuff and it should be attached down uh, to the bone below. And so we clean up those uh, bad edges and really try to mobilize the rotator cuff tissue. And then these are those anchors that we use to place um, those heavy duty sutures so that we can then fix or repair that tendon back to bone. So this is kind of demonstrating um, how we pass these sutures uh, through the tissue so that we can <clears throat> use those to eventually compress that rotator cuff down to bone. And so then we repeat the same process kind of staggered or placed intermittently throughout uh, the humeral head, which is the ball of the shoulder, so that we can accurately recreate that footprint on the, on the humerus. So then once we have those sutures passed through <clears throat> the tissue, we uh, are able to put in another anchor kind of further down the humerus. And as you can see that, we kind of compress that tendon on the bone as that anchor is inserted. And those sutures are going to provide that time zero fixation <clears throat> for our natural tendon. And then over time, the body is going to uh, really scar that tissue into place uh, so that eventually this, you know, these anchors and this suture material really isn't doing much, but there's a, a good view of what a rotator cuff tear looks like when it's done arthroscopically. So other treatment options do exist and are applied in certain scenarios. If you remember back to the uh, beginning of the presentation, I I talked about an irreparable rotator cuff tear, and those are situations where the tendon is atrophied. Uh, there's not really any healthy tissue to sew back down um, to the humeral head and restore function. And so there are some treatment options in those settings that we do employ. Some of these include tendon transfers. Uh, basically, the idea behind a tendon transfer is you Think of it like robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're trying to uh, take a tendon from somewhere else that's, that's not, um, or they can be sacrificed for one role and reroute it up to the shoulder in order to recreate the uh, rotator cuff and its function there. Another option is what's called a superior capsular reconstruction. Uh, this is where we use... Um, cadaver tissue to kind of recreate the, the a static bridge of tissue between the socket and the ball to try to help stabilize the shoulder a little bit better and decrease pain and inflammation. There's a newer device on the market called an in-space balloon from a company named Stryker. Uh, you can look that up online if you feel like looking into that a little bit, but similar to a superior capsular reconstruction. And then finally, um, we do utilize what's called a reverse total shoulder replacement in certain situations where uh, patients are a little bit more advanced in age and they have an irreparable rotator cuff. Uh, these are um, very successful procedures to restore function and eliminate pain. As with any surgical procedure, there are complications. So the way I view my job as a surgeon is to educate patients <clears throat> regarding the risks and benefits associated with any treatment that we undertake. Uh, the main thing that we worry about with rotator cuff tear is recurrence of that tear or failure of the repair. The most common cause of a failed rotator cuff is because that, that process of your body scarring that tissue down, it, it just didn't heal properly. Uh, and that can result in those sutures kind of pulling out through that tissue. 
and leading to the recurrence of the tear. So you find yourself back into that same position with pain and loss of function. And if you're over the age of 65, you are at an increased risk of having a non-healing rotator cuff, um, which is a, a scenario that we like to avoid. So uh, we need to kind of take the age into consideration when we're talking about repairing a rotator cuff. If the tear is large, so by definition, if it's greater than five centimeters from the front, from the kind of the anterior to posterior or front to back dimension um, on its insertion on the humerus, then uh, that's considered a large tear that has a higher failure rate just because you're, you're trying to get more tissue to heal. Atrophy is one that we really look at closely with respect to the imaging, like an MRI to see how much atrophy has occurred in the muscle bellies of the rotator cuff, because that can help us predict those patients who are going to go on to do well versus those patients who are going to fail a rotator cuff repair. Diabetes is a really important risk factor. To an extent, we can control it. So patients need to be really careful about their um, keeping their hemoglobin A1C or their average blood sugars uh, to an appropriate level. Because if it's, if it's too high, uh, you set yourself up for infections and really poor healing response from the body. Again, smokers, so something we can control. Smoking is going to decrease the blood flow to that tissue, and it's going to increase the likelihood of that tissue not healing back to bone. One that we, we kind of gloss over a lot, but it's poor compliance with the post-op uh, protocol. So we as surgeons go in, we spend our day fixing these tears. And then that's the easy part. The hard part is the rehab afterwards because it's time consuming. Um, it's not something where you wake up from surgery and your rotator cuff is healed and you're good to go. So there's a period of immobilization where you're in a sling. Really the main function or purpose of the sling is to prevent you from overusing your arm and increasing the likelihood of that tendon from re-tearing before your body has a chance to scar it down. So I can't stress that enough to be diligent about following those post-operative protocols that are put in place by your surgical team, um, including your orthopedic surgeon and your therapist and those people that are going to work closely with you to help you regain the function of your arm. And then lastly, if you have more than one tendon involved, you're at an increased risk. That kind of goes back to the size of the tear. So more than one tendon equals more um, geography that's affected. So it's going to uh, cause problems. Probably the most common thing that I see as a complication after shoulder surgery uh, or not necessarily shoulder surgery, but rotator cuff repair is post-operative stiffness. The technical term is adhesive capsulitis. And when you're immobilized and you're uh, working through the pain postoperatively, people tend to get really stiff and tight. So we spend a lot of our rehab efforts on regaining our motion uh, so that we don't get overly stiff. And eventually, if we're too tight, we're not going to be able to strengthen the shoulder. We're not going to be able to return to activity level. And so that stiffness is, the, in my mind, is the most critical thing that we, that we battle early on in the recovery. Uh, most of it resolves within three to four months after uh, surgery. Uh, some of the risk factors for, for developing a stiff shoulder after include uh, calcific tendonitis. If you had preoperative stiffness, so it's not uncommon that I will see somebody who needs their rotator cuff repaired, but they're very stiff. I will send them to therapy before surgery to really try to get their motion back. And then once they have their motion restored, we go back and we fix their rotator cuff because that preoperative motion is uh, a real good indicator of who's going to be stiff after under age 50 and workers' compensation are uh, other things in the literature that are associated with postoperative stiffness. People who end up getting stiff may require additional injections to decrease the inflammation, kind of get the scar tissue to become more manageable, if you will, and a lot more therapy than you would normally see in a typical situation. Sometimes we even have to go back in a second time and do another procedure like a manipulation or another scope where we go in and we kind of release that scar tissue to try to jumpstart the motion. So 
as a surgeon, I worry about stiffness above all things. So just something to think about as you're getting into those post-op protocols and uh, meeting with a therapist and doing your home exercise program. So in conclusion, rotator cuff tears are really common. It's one of the most common surgical procedures that I perform. And I do multiple rotator cuff repairs a week just because of how, how common they are for, for folks. Um, I would emphasize that just because you have a tear does not mean that you have to have surgery and it doesn't mean that it has to be painful. So most of the time I see patients who have these kind of ups and downs where their shoulder will bother them for quite some time. Maybe they get an injection and do some therapy and it cools off and they're good for a while. And then it comes back and they kind of go through this up and down process. So really it's up to you to decide when the time is right to do surgery and based on how it's affecting you, your pain levels, um, your ability to get sleep, all of those things. In terms of modern surgical procedures, uh, it's a very high success rate, success rate for those patients who undergo surgery as we've improved our anchors and our sutures and our technology and really being selective in our surgical indications and recommending the right surgery for each person based on all of those kind of intrinsic factors to that person. So if you find yourself uh, sitting at home watching this video and you have a rotator cuff tear, uh, or you think you might have a rotator cuff tear, I uh, encourage you to give me a call, come by, visit with me. I'd love to go over your uh, physical exam and history, um, get some imaging ordered and go over that with you so you can see what your rotator cuff looks like on, on the imaging itself. And then come up with a custom plan to help you get back to feeling like yourself and getting back into those activities that bring you joy and satisfaction. Um, so I appreciate your time and I uh, look forward to seeing you in my office in the future.